Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Hardly Hardly of the Saints. The 18th Sunday of Pentecost. Anyone from the military party 18th Sunday of Pentecost? As we are able, please stand and we have a way for the pleasure of the Lord. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sisters and brothers, bear one another in love, maintain the unity of the Spirit, and the bond of peace, and take no part in the unfruitful works of the darkness, but instead expose them. Let's confess our sins of judgment of God and one another. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have not read the Bible word in the preaching to which I have been called. I have not heard the word of my heart. I have not heard the word of the Lord himself say, I am not acting according to your will. I am grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on me.
You know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First lesson comes from Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating the proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten our have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lies are mine, the life of the parent shall, as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their unrighteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die. For, for the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from their wickedness that they have committed, and do what is lawful and right, for they shall save their lives, because they have considered and turned away from all from all the transgressions that they have committed. They shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, and according all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all of your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will, will be your sin. Excuse me. Iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves in a new heart and a new spirit. Why you will die, O house of, o house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord. <coughs> Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will sing it at Psalm 25.
Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard the quality of God as something to be exploited, but in himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should be in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always been obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, <coughs> work at your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. And he speaks now. Christmas time, one of my favorite movies is shown on the TV, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart. In the movie, Jimmy plays a man named George Bailey. George's big dreams of going to college and being a world traveler. Instead, he winds up having to take over his father's building and mill, which is more like a charity than a business. George becomes so disappointed in what he has become that one day he decides to take his own life. He says, I wish I'd never been born. At that moment, his guardian angel, Clarence, 
intervenes and shows him what life would have been like had he never been born. His hometown of Bedford Falls would have become Pottersville, named after the greedy old man. His old boss, the druggist, who had, who had turned into the town drunk because George wouldn't have been there to stop him from making a fatal error in a prescription. His brother, who he saved from drowning, saved a full tanker full of soldiers from drowning through transport. The angel shows him how many lives he touched with his life. All of us want to be like George Bailey. We all want to know that our lives have counted, that we have made a difference in the lives of others. This was a call letter for the Philippian Christians. In our text, he says that he wants to rejoice in the day of Christ, that he has not run in vain, neither labored in vain. He wants to know that his efforts on them had not been wasted, that they had become difference makers in this world. In the first several verses of this chapter, Paul focuses on what believers are to be inside of the body of Christ as they interact with one another. Then Paul begins to talk about what our impact should be on the world. Just before our text, in verse 13, Paul says that God's works in the believer both to will that means giving in the desire and to do his god's good pleasure in our text paul begins by saying do all things the christian life is a life of doing it is not a life of sitting but a life of serving we are to be doers of the word faith that does not result in some kind of service is dead james says but there is a way that we are to serve god a manner in which we are to conduct ourselves. Without murmurings and disputes, the word murmuring means whispering or muttering. It speaks of private complaining, grumbling. One of the most unbecoming things a Christian can be is a chronic complainer. Always finding fault, never contented, never happy. A monk entered a monastery in which he agreed to take a vow of silence. He could only speak two words every 10 years. After the first 10 years, he was brought before the leader. He said, bed hard. 10 years later, he was brought before the leader again. He said, food bad. 10 years later, he was brought before the leader again. He said, I quit. <laughs> the leader said, well, it doesn't surprise me. You haven't done anything but complain for the last 30 years. <laughs> There are some Christians who never seem to speak unless it is a word of complaint, either about the condition or someone else or the church. All of us have our complaints from time to time, but some are constant complainers. Complainers are seldom difference makers. Usually they are on the sidelines criticizing those who are making a difference. Bailey Smith, an evangelist said, he had a man in his church once that never had a positive thing to say. In a business meeting, he called a man and asked him to pray, but this is what he said. Brother so-and-so, will you please stand and lead us in a word of discouragement at this time? Not only does chronic complaint damage our testimony and discourage others, it is very displeasing to God. Jesus has gloriously entered Jerusalem. Those who see him coming riding a colt cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. They call for Jesus to save them. So Jesus goes into the temple to address the corrupt religious system established there. While he is there, some children cry out again, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. But, this, but the chief priests and elders say, why are you not stopping him from saying this? Jesus responds by saying, Have you not read? Out of the mouths of infants and babies you have declared praise. Then he leaves the temple and returns to Bethany. In the morning as he was returning to the city, he ate hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. 
and the fig tree withered and died at once. When the disciples saw this, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not be taken, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. The next day he starts back toward Jerusalem, Jerusalem, but he stops along the way because he gets hungry. When he sees another fig tree alongside the road of the leaves, he stops to get some figs. Fig trees were not generally in bloom at this time of year, but if it has leaves, it should have figs. That's the way fig trees work. Jesus is hungry, so he goes over to get some breakfast. When he gets there, he finds out that this fig tree is empty also. He becomes angry. He curses the fig tree, saying, May no fruit ever come from you again. Doesn't that sound like something we would say in the morning before our breakfast and coffee? But when Jesus does it, something remarkable happens. This fig tree also withers noticeably in front of the disciples, and they are blown away. They ask him, how did the fig tree wither like that? Jesus tells them that God will not allow them to work much greater miracles than that. If they have faith and do not doubt, he will give them whatever they ask in prayer if they have faith. This is an odd event. Why would Jesus curse a tree for not having any fruit? Is Jesus angry? The point of this event is not to demonstrate how Jesus hates empty fig trees, Jesus is giving us a picture to illustrate everything that is about to happen in the following chapters. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is like this fig tree. It stretches a bunch of leaves with no fruit. As he enters the city, we will see that the leaders appear to be righteous, but they refuse to submit to the Messiah. They are fruitless and there to be a curse. In the end, will Jesus judge Jerusalem just like the fig tree as he foretells its destruction? Charles Campbell, professor of homiletics at Duke University, offers this great commentary about having a conversation with Jesus. He writes, A few years ago while channel surfing, I paused and watched a part of an interview with television psychologist and celebrity Dr. Phil. At one point, the interviewer asked Dr. Phil, if you could interview anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Dr. Phil replied without hesitation, Jesus Christ. I would really like to interview Jesus Christ. I would like to have a conversation with him about the meaning of life. As soon as Dr. Phil spoke, I remember thinking, no, no, you wouldn't. You would not want to sit down with Jesus treat him like an interviewee, and ask him about the meaning of life. You would be crazy to do that. He would turn you upside down and inside out. He would confound all your questions and probably end up telling you to sell everything you own, give the money to the poor, and come follow him. No, Dr. Phil, you do not really want to interview Jesus Christ, and I do not want to either. It would not go well. Dr. Campbell's point in telling the story is that conversations with Jesus are dangerous. They are very, very dangerous because Jesus is always going to twist and turn your thinking, leave your head spinning, and leave you feeling confounded. Jesus is always going to be moving us beyond the safety of our preconceived notions, perspectives, and ideas about God. And quite honestly, when these dangerous conversations take place, the participants will rarely leave the encounter seems to be him like safe in the arms of Jesus. As we encounter Jesus today back in the temple, it is the final week of his life. Just one day earlier, he had entered Jerusalem, accompanied by shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, as people were proclaiming him king. He then went to the temple and literally turned the tables, knocking them over as he drove out the money change. He called the temple a den of thieves. It had been 
an eventful day, to say the least. Things are becoming intense, and there is growing even violent controversy between Jesus and the temple leadership. So it is the morning of the next day, and as he has returned to the temple, as he enters, he is confronted by the chief priests and elders of the people who try to trap him with a question about authority. They think they are the ones who are in charge and they have ultimate authority at the temple. Excuse me. So they demand to know, by what authority are you doing these things? Believing they have control and are in charge, they are ready to challenge whatever Jesus says. Well, the chief priest and elders is stuck with a challenge of disease. Jesus results in some very dangerous conversations. What they are not prepared for is hearing that Jesus' authority comes not from another human being, but from heaven. Jesus' voice, a trapped figuratively turns the tables on the religious leaders with a thorny question of his own. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? This is a very dangerous question because of making a commitment about John's authority the religious leaders would also make a commitment about John's witness to Jesus and thus Jesus' authority. Oh yes, the tables have really been turned and the interviewee has now become the interviewer. Jesus outwits the religious leaders, places questions back on them and thus unmasks the deepest priorities and concerns. You see, the religious leaders are not really interested in Jesus' true identity, or in discovering how God would have them respond to Jesus. Now what they are really interested in is maintaining their privilege, power, and control, and they want to keep the current order intact. They want to keep Jesus in their tiny little box, or have nothing to do with him. Yes, this was a dangerous conversation indeed. The religious leaders are left speechless, and the interview appears to have ended. But Jesus does not stop. He knows they are off balance and confounded, and so he tells them a story, one of his favorite teaching tools. He tells them of two sons. When the father directs the first son to go to work in the vineyard, the mouth of the rebellious son emphatically answers, No, I will not go. But then he changes his mind and goes away. The second son, who appears dutiful and obedient, answers that he will go, but then he does not. When Jesus asked his questionnaires, which of the sons did the will of his father, they say, the first. Again, this is a very dangerous conversation indeed. According to this parable, those who are apparently in the know are not the ones who are doing the will of God. The tables are turned again. You see, Jesus' stories are questions, and questions are seldom about right answers. Rather, they are about calling his father followers and his healers to be transformed. The question really is not about what is the will of God. It is about the deep question of who belongs in God's realm or kingdom. And through this exchange and his question, Jesus can fix the scribes and elders of their lack of belief, and finally it asserts that the despised faithful tax collectors and prostitutes will enter heaven before they will. Talk about dangerous conversation. This whole exchange begins with in the no religious leaders authoritatively questioning Jesus, and it ends up with a pronouncement that they will follow revile tax collectors and shun prostitutes into heaven. Yes, conversations with Jesus are extreme, extremely dangerous. Jesus is not interested in simply talking with us about the meaning of life. He is always confronting us with the issue of his identity and the call to his faith. What do you say that I am? And Jesus is not about small talk or beating around the bush. Jesus wants our very own life. And he's going to do whatever it takes, even going to the supreme measure of ultimately dying on the cross to unmask our deadly priorities and call us to faith in him. Yes, conversations with Jesus 
are dangerous indeed. We do not begin by interviewing Jesus, but by believing in him, Trust, trusting in his authority and following him to the places where he goes. It is God alone who is in charge. Once about upon a time, there was a theater who was fancy, elegant, and beautiful. The people that attended were beautiful, elegant, and fancy too. Many performances were held in this amazing space, plays, operas, and occasional ballet. The people who went to this theater always felt they belonged to something special, and indeed they did. Each performance was spectacular. One evening, evening, people began to arrive for the night performance, only to find something quite unusual. It, that, it was something that was not elegant or fancy, or the least bit beautiful. In fact, it was something rather disturbing. On the floor, in the middle of the main aisle, was a man who was dressed as nicely as the others, but reeking in pain, crying, oh, wow, oh. People started arriving in the theater in great numbers, and they took notice of this strange affair, but they did not want to get involved. So they had their tickets ripped by the usher and found their seats. Some headed down the side aisles to get their seats, even if their seats were closer to the center aisle. Some walked around him, swapped him, some walked over him. Still, he withered on the floor. Ooh, ah, oh. As the crowd began to fill in, people were getting uncomfortable. Men adjusted their ties. Ladies looked in their purses, trying to find something else to occupy their time. Everyone was too polite to stare, yet it was impossible not to be drawn in and made anxious by his curious fellow, well, excuse me, and his antics as he laughed and roared. And Usher was summoned to do something about the man, just to make it stop. He was becoming more than a distraction and becoming a nuisance. He already was an annoyance. So the uh, Usher approached him and asked him several questions that did not matter. Did the man have his ticket? Could he find his seat? Was he in the right section? On and on it went, but the man raving on the floor only got a little louder. Ooh, ah, oh, now the theater was full. Unsure what to do next, the usher gathered his team. What could they do with this man? Just to get him out of there. Whatever they were going to do, they needed to do it fast because they were running out of time. The orchestra in the pit was already tuning their instrument. Yet they were overtaken by the man on the floor who was almost out of screen. Ooh, ah, oh. The show was almost ready to begin. The ushers could not stop this man, so they went and found the manager. Managers had a lot to do for a production, and something like this was not normally on their list. But something had to be done. The manager came and too asked questions that didn't matter. And all eyes were on the manager and the man on the floor. The orchestra stopped playing and looked over their instruments in the pit to see what was happening. Just as the manager asked the question, the only question that mattered at all, where are you from? The man stopped, no more old, no more ah, no more old. He picked up his hand slowly and pointed up. And in a slow, raspy, but loud enough voice, no longer could hear him. The balcony. Sometimes we know the answer to our question before we even ask it. The religious authorities in the gospel passage today treat Jesus that way. They ask Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? But they know the answer. He was an annoyance, a distraction, a nuisance, and they needed to deal with him. They knew he was a heretic, a political deviant, and the fact that they had probably only confirmed in their minds that he was a charlatan. They knew he was. They knew the answer. He was from the North Country, from some backwater. People called him rabbi, but he probably didn't even go to seminary. He probably just downloaded some certificate to give himself credentials. They knew he needed to go, say they sought to expose him. So they asked him, by what authority do you do these things? What they are really asking him is, where are you from? The balcony? Then they got it. Just as in the theater, the audience was caught dead in their tracks. 
as all was revealed before them, falling around us real ones who were fallen, broken, believing, not the man on the floor. Jesus exposes these religious authorities as the real charlatans, the real heretics, the real original deviants. Now Jesus called them out, calling them the ones from the balcony. He was more than an annoyance, a nuisance, and a distraction. He had to go. He had to go now. We too are from the balcony. We know what it is like to be passed by, stepped around, stepped over, not to be stepped on. We also know what it's like to make some those who say the justice, judgments, to go down the side aisles, to adjust our ties and look at our handbags and try to look the other way. We have been passed by, stepped around, stepped over, and stepped on others. The then Bishop of Durham, Dr. Brooke Klaus Westcott, was making a train here. In those days, carriages contained separate compartments for six people. And he sought out an empty compartment and settled down for a read. Just as the train was about to depart, the door opened and a young girl in exhalation army of uniform jumped in. After she had settled herself in her corner, she like realized she was sharing the compartment. With his purple clerical shop shirt, white collar, and oversized silver cross, she was sharing the compartment with a real live bishop. She had long been a Christian and was keen to win others for Christ. Presently, she leaned across to the bishop who was reading and said very abruptly, Excuse me, are you saved? This short but unexpected question caught Dr. Westcott by surprise, and he said in his kindly way, Pardon me, what did you say? She thought, There, he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. And so he explained, and so she explained. I simply asked if you were saved. The bishop's face disappeared behind his book, and his eyes twinkled merrily for a moment. Then leaning forward to her, he asked her, Excuse me, my dear, but do you mean soap eyes, or sensible windows, or souls windows? The girl's face went blank, then puzzled, then startled. Finally, she blurted out, I don't know what you are talking about. I simply asked you if you were saved. Yes, my dear, replied Dr. Westcott. I asked you which saved you mean. You mean I was saved, or I will be saved, or I am being saved. And for the rest of the journey, this Greek scholar explained to young believer the wonder and immensity of God's salvation, past, present, and future. Note the progression. We are called to work out what God is working in. Because as Bishop Westcott pointed out to the young lady in the train, there is a past, a present, and a future dimension to salvation. We have been saved from the penalty of sin by the cross, past tense. This is our justification. We will be saved from the presence of sin, future tense. That, that is our glorification in heaven. And we are being saved from the power of sin, present time, our sanctification on earth as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Our English word for energy comes from the word translated works. It is the word of God, God, divine energy at work in us and through us. The same Holy Spirit empowered Christ to relieve Satan, cast out demons, and raise the dead, and dwells us also. This process is not about imitation, trying to be like Jesus, but rather incarnation, and dwell by the Holy Spirit. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave me himself for me. The principle here is that God must work in us so that he can then work through us. Salvation is the work of God from the beginning to the end. Then, what is the promise of salvation? Two things are promised here that we don't get easily put together. Suffering and joy. The faith of the believers in Philippi and elsewhere gave Paul joy. Sacrifice and service are the hallmarks of authentic spirituality. When Jesus returns, we will see that our labor was not in vain. But we do not have to wait for the return. 
return of Christ to experience his joy. It comes as we recognize the process behind our salvation, realize the purpose of our salvation, and rejoice in the promise of salvation. When Billy Graham was 96 years old, he was probably the best known, most loved, and well respected Christian in the world. In January 2000, the leaders in North Charlotte, North Carolina, invited their favorite son to a luncheon in his honor. Then a spiritually 81-year-old Dr. Graham initially hesitated to accept because he struggled with Parkinson's disease. But the Charlotte leader said, we don't expect a major dress, just come and let us honor you. So he agreed. After some wonderful things were said about him, Dr. Graham stepped to the podium, looked at the crowd and said, I'm reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist, who this month has been honored by Time Magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle, punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his best pocket. He couldn't find his ticket, so he reached in his other pocket. He couldn't find a ticket there either. It wasn't there, so he looked at his briefcase, couldn't find it. Then he looked at his seat by him, couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know you who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought, bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle punching tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the great physicist down on his hands and knees, looking under his seat for his ticket. Several minutes later, the conductor made his way back to the trooper coach and saw Einstein in a terrible fit on his hands and knees, looking under his seat for his ticket. Dr. Einstein, he said, I told you not to worry. We trust you. Einstein looked up and said, what you don't understand, I don't know where I'm going. Billy Graham continued, see the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My wife, my children, and my grandchildren are telling me I've got me a little slop slobbery in my old age. I used to be a bit more fastidious, so I went out and bought a new suit for this lunch and one more occasion. You know what the other occasion is? This suit is in which, this is the suit in which I'll be buried. But when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to meet to remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. I hope and pray we can all answer this question by the Reverend Dr. Billy Gray.
Petition's response to the mercy of God is receive our prayer. Remembering the appearing and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We put our trust in you as we pray for the church. Give bishops, pastors, deacons, and teachers the gifts of wisdom and discernment. Be with them in bold truth and faithful witness. Merciful God, receive our prayer. prayer. Lead us in your truth as we pray for creation. Empower us to look to the interests of others as we make choices that impact the environment. Summon us to be advocates for healthy waterways, habitat, and air. Merciful God, receive our prayer. prayer. Lead us in justice as we pray for those in government, the military, and other positions of authority. Give them humble and willing hearts, looking to the needs of others. We pray also for our enemies. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Trust in your goodness, we pray for all caregivers and people who are sick, are suffering in any way, especially those who are prayerless and in their hearts. Give them encouragement and consolation in your presence. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Teach us your paths as we pray for this congregation. Be at work in us and unite us in your love as we labor together for the sake of the gospel. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give thanks for all the saints who have died, secure in the knowledge of salvation, especially for Ruth. Keep us fearless in our faith in certain of your resurrection. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Remembering us according to your steadfast love as we offer these in the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion, may known through Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you always. And all with you. Let us pray. Mercy of God, as the grains of wheat scattered upon the heaven were gathered to become one bread, so the church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into one, excuse me, into a kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now we continue the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And we shall not be to the creation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Know the love of Christ and have surpassed your knowledge, so that you may be filled with, the, with all the fullness of God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, are there any announcements? Council of Honor.
What does I wish for the world to change?